when I posted the snippet, it wasn't with the goal of releasing a song. It was like, I found a YouTube instrumental uh, like from the song and I just recorded something over it. It was an idea I had and then an hour later I recorded it and posted it. Like it wasn't a, a planned thing. When you haven't figured yourself out as an artist yet and you haven't fully developed a fan base who like is really, you know, connected to you and what you're making, then there isn't that much that a label can offer you because they're not gonna give you, uh, you know, millions of dollars of marketing and all of this, you know, personnel support to blow up the thing that you post. Like if you are early in signing a label deal, what you're doing is they're like, we're gonna have you in house in case you blow up. And then we're gonna do all this stuff for you. Early on, I'd be going to these meetings and it's kind of like, the conversation is like, okay, cool. What are you gonna post on TikTok? What are you gonna do? They're just asking me what I'm gonna do to you know, promote all this music. And I'm like, wait, what am I talking to y'all for? What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brian Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And as you know, we love to bring on guests who have something to offer, insight. They're doing something different. And today we have on an independent artist, a dope artist by the name of Paul Russell. Appreciate you pulling up, man. Well, actually allowing us to pull up, my bad. <laughs> you guys are welcome. Welcome anytime. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, man, there's a lot of things that I would love to talk to you about today. You know, like, because obviously you've had this wave on TikTok. You're, you know, almost at 2 million monthly listeners. But of course, we got to get some backstory. So, you know, you're wait from Decatur. You know, I want to claim you. Hey, all right. But then, <laughs> Decatur, Georgia. But you moved to Dallas early on. And now you are here in L.A. Now. Obviously, there's a lot of artists that come to LA, but like, were you creating music in Dallas on uh, as you you know came up, and what was it like then? What was your inspiration um, yeah. early on? It was it's weird because I mean I definitely think my music has changed a lot over time. Like back then, uh, you know, there's like a big like folk music kind of. Uh, scene in in the Dallas area and so I grow up going to all these folk shows and I was listening to a lot of that kind of stuff and so I would make you know I got a ukulele because this girl had a ukulele and, and she was pretty cool and I was like you know trying to spit game and so uh, I get a ukulele. I know pretty cool man. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I started playing with that and just like making little songs uh, and then I you know I went out to college and I started to you know, think about the music that was being made in Atlanta, being made, you know, back in Decatur, you know, and, and feeling like, how can I kind of bridge the gap between this kind of folk stuff where I'm playing the ukulele and I'm singing and this, you know, hip hop stuff that I'm really interested in that, you know, my family's listening to that, that I'm really connecting with from, you know, a culture perspective. And so, yeah, yeah. So it kind of shifted over time. And, but, but yeah, by the time I got to college, it was just a lot of trial and error of trying to do both of those things justice in the same type of song. Uh, and then I think that's, that's kind of what I was trying to do as well when I came out here to LA. But I think there's, there's just so much in LA that inspires me. And I think those two pieces plus the kind of LA vibe of like, it's sunny outside, it's summer, it's like a feel good place. I think those three elements together is kind of what created the sound that I, I'd say I have now. So, yeah. What's it like to work on combining sounds? Is it intentional or did it just organically happen? I think, uh, yeah, I, I think it organically happened. You know, like the first time I ever made music, I made, I made some folk stuff and I made some hip hop stuff and it was like, those are two separate worlds and I'm just, you know, playing to the two sides of myself. But I think over time, I would start making one type of song and then it would just feel like, oh, okay, like I can go into this, you know, it's like, okay, I'm singing, but now I'm rapping because it's like, I've, I'm used to doing both of those things. And so that's kind of how it started to happen. But then I, I think over time, you know, you start to realize 
oh, you know, maybe there's a lane here. And then it became like, let me try to figure out how to weave it all together, which I think TikTok helped a lot with that as well. Like, because you get to just test stuff out with people, you know, like I would, I did a, a thing on TikTok where I was uh, like remixing songs. Like I take a song that's already popular and then I'd find an instrumental to it and then I'd like rap a verse on it. And so with that, I got to try out a bunch of different types of music, like as the instrumentals and, you know, think through, okay, what would I do here? How would I, you know, and I think that also played a big role in figuring out what the sound is and like where the intersection lies between the two or the three kind of worlds I'm in, like, and how to communicate that, you know, sonically. So, yeah. That's really interesting because, you know, obviously there's been a lot of pushback about TikTok from artists or even having to create content. But then, of course, you see the ones take advantage and you say, oh, man, this is a great space where you can build an audience without having to, like, spend a lot of cash, right? Yeah. yeah. But then even this practicality of finding my sound or testing and not just testing a song. Like, we, t we talk about that even as marketers. Uh, but, like, I'm testing what type of song I want to be on and seeing the audience's reaction. I haven't really heard that before. Um, can you go deeper into like maybe a specific song or just multiple songs of how like the things you observed um, and that kind of gave you that direction in that process? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because I, I remember when I first started doing the remix thing, I think one of the first remixes I did was like, it was a hip hop song. And because that was what I thought like, okay, I'm, you know, I like making the hip hop stuff. And, you know, I think it was like, like what's popping or something. And I was like, okay, I'll take the beat and I'll rap on it, you know? And then I think, you know, that did decent and like people connected with it, but it just felt like, okay, how can I keep doing the same thing, but with stuff that's maybe more surprising. And I think a lot of it came out of that. And so I remember uh, doing some like pop records, like some, some Dua Lipa songs where, you know, I would, same thing. And it kind of felt like, okay, like maybe the, maybe my voice and the sort of cadences that I, you know, go to mentally when I'm writing something work well with the kind of pop thing. And then it's like, I did some, you know, I did some like country stuff a couple of times. I did, you know, I think one of the ones that did the best was it was like, I took a Disney song. And it was like, uh, Won't Sam in Love from like the Hercules movie. Right. And yeah. Yeah. I like, I just added, it's a good movie. <laughs> and the soundtrack is goaded. Like it's undefeated. It's so good. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just, I took the instrumental and I added some trap drums on it and I just rapped over that. And like, that was like my first big moment on, on TikTok. And yeah, I think from that, I started to feel like at least like, okay, people are okay with me taking risks from an instrumental perspective. Like, and so I think that gave me the freedom to be like, okay, let me try to make an actual song that, you know, I'm not making songs that sound like Disney songs, but I, it's like, I know that I can try something new and it can connect with people. And I think to some degree, what I started to realize was that like, if the stuff that I'm saying and the way that I'm saying it is very like, you know, it's got some swag to it. It's like rooted in like culture and it's, uh, it, it feels familiar and it feels like, it feels like hip hop, but it's also melodic. Like doing that sort of thing on top of any beat, even if it's a really weird beat, like has the potential to connect with people. And I think making that realization for me is what freed me for just trying a bunch of new things with like, you know, from a production standpoint when I started making stuff that I'd release. Um, so yeah, I guess that's how I saw it. I think it's not necessarily the case that I hopped on a song and I was like, man, I wanna make something exactly like this song so I can drop it and I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. It was more like, okay, I know the sorts of risks I'm able to take and I know what people, you know, like about, you know, whatever I make. Got you. Got you. Yeah, that's a dope insight, man. Like just to hear you go through that process. It sounds like you're pretty. I mean, it's like you're you're you you, you straddle those sides well of like being free, like taking risks, having that artist side, but then still being a little bit of analytical on at the same time. Yeah. 
are you deep into the stats and the analytics? Like, hey, how's this doing? And I got to post a certain amount of times a, a week. Like, what's your process? Uh, I mean, on TikTok and stuff like that, I'll pay attention to the analytics. Like I've had seasons where it's like, bro, I'm like looking every day. I'm like, okay, oh, what did this do? They stopped watching at two seconds or, you know, whatever. But honestly, a lot of that didn't necessarily help me to make better stuff. I think it's like, I think I am very much looking at like trial and error of like, okay, this went well. What do I think? did well about it. Like why did people connect with this video as opposed to that video or this song as opposed to that song? And then I'll just try to think through that when I make another thing. Like I, I definitely think like biggest learning for me early on was that like having something that either I say something that captures your attention or there's some like aspect of the song that I'm posting that connects with the, the audience like that helps so much. Like I think the remix things worked because it would be a song that, oh, I know that song. And so now the guy, you know, and whenever I would write my own music and release that, I start to learn like, okay, if I write a song and the first sentence that I say in the song is a sentence that someone's used to hearing or something that they would expect to hear in a song, then maybe they're going to swipe. But if I say something that, you know, is clever or something that you've never heard before, then that's going to make you go, oh, what, what, what did you have to say? You know, so like, I think a lot of it's been figuring out. That, that makes so stuff. much sense because the first thing I think about, actually two things that we, we, we didn't, we talked about these artists, right? So, hello, Christ, I'm out to sin again, right? Yeah. Fly in a boss. Yeah. And then we talked about the, uh, you brought up, uh, what's his name? Central C, Central, right? Yeah. And, and we all know how that song yeah. starts. You, the first time you hear it, you got to... Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So that, that makes a lot of sense. It's almost it's like thinking of the first line as a hook. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Wow. When Because I, I sat down one day, and similarly, I looked at all the songs that have blown up on TikTok for the past couple of years, and it felt like every single one of them, almost, like 90% of them, the first line was something that I was not expecting to hear, at least, you know? Yeah. Which, yeah, it seems like that's a lane for sure. <laughs> so, so are you taking it into your current songwriting? Like, do you, do you go into certain songs thinking like, okay, I need to have a part or make sure I have a line that's hitting them hard out the gate or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I think, like, it's a thing also where I'm, I'm learning how to do that. Because I, I think, you know, I think I've, I've started to incorporate that into music, which is been a benefit but I've also started to realize like okay that's not the only way to work you know like the song right now that like I put a post up about it and it's growing a lot it doesn't say anything that crazy in the I mean I guess you my little boo thing is not uh, like I, I guess it's it's different but it's not like whoa what is he talking about you know but I, I think the fact the sort of beat that it's on and the fact that it's something that it sounds unexpected as a total package like I, I think yeah yeah so I don't know I think about it all but I think it's, it's, it's just a process of trying to learn what applies to what song and how you apply it yeah okay that okay. sample how do you get a sample like that <laughs> that, that that's a classic classic so yeah. it's like was that hard to clear or so I mean we're still like when I posted the snippet it wasn't with the goal of releasing a song it was like I found a YouTube instrumental uh, like from the song and I just recorded something over it and I, I it was just like a a fun thing like I it was an idea I had and then an hour later I recorded it and posted it like it wasn't a, a planned thing and then now on the back end we're going through the process of clearing it and like we've, we've made a lot of progress and so I, I think it's gonna be I think I think we're gonna be set um, but yeah yeah it's, it's just a thing where like I was lucky that this video blew up at a time where I already had like a management team and like labels who I was talking to and like connections in the music industry. And so it's like, oh, okay, this is working. Now all these people are willing to help turn this into a real song. Whereas if I, you know, that would have blown up a year ago, it wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have had any avenue to get it cleared. You mentioned labels. You're not signed yet. Why is that? I mean, I, I think I think signing too early is... Well, I think on, on one level, 
signing too early is a bad idea oftentimes because you haven't really figured yourself out as an artist yet. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think everyone has their moment where it's the right time. But I, I think when you haven't figured yourself out as an artist yet and you haven't fully developed a fan base who, like, is really, you know, connected to you and what you're making, then there isn't that much that a label can offer you because they're not going to give you, uh, you know, millions of dollars of marketing and all of this, you know, personnel support to you know, blow up the thing that you post. Like if you are early in signing a label deal, what you're doing is they're like, we're gonna have you in house in case you blow up. And then we're gonna do all this stuff for you, you know? And so it's like, I'd be, early on, I'd be going to these meetings and it's kind of like, the conversation is like, okay, cool. What are you gonna post on TikTok? What are you gonna do? They're just asking me what I'm gonna do to, you know, promote all this music going on. I'm like, wait, what am I talking to y'all for? And then, you know, and so I like, I think like over time as like music has grown for me, the conversations have changed, you know, and, and it's like the conversations turned into like, oh, okay, there is a radio angle for this or that. Or, you know, they're talking about, oh, maybe you can hop on this person's tour or hop on that person's tour or like, oh, we can connect you to this artist that, you know, we think you'd be really good with, you know, so it's like, once you've built up that fan base and that brand to a certain point, then it starts to become useful because they see the value in actually putting resources behind it. You know? All right, so I want to give a reminder that being independent is not just about not being signed to a label. It's actually making money without being signed to a label, being able to have a sustainable career. And for those of y'all who actually want to be able to make money from your fan base, you're serious about figuring out how to monetize. I have a free video that you can check out. I don't need your email. I don't need your phone number. I don't need any information. All you have to do is go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. And I'm going to show you the lies that artists have been told that have been keeping them, probably you too, from monetizing your fan base and how shifting that perspective has allowed one artist we're working with to be on track to make over $500,000 this year. This is a different era. Don't fall for that trap saying artists can't make money. Artists do not have to be broke. So if you want to escape that trap, go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. You do have to make sure you put the www in the beginning when you type it in your URL and watch this free video again. You're not going to be asked to put in your email. You're not going to be asked for your phone number, but it won't be up forever. Check it out. Yeah, so, so what are you, because it doesn't sound like you're against signing to a label, obviously, like, you, you, yeah. you don't sound like, you know, like, what's what I'm looking for, like, hyper-independent in, yeah. in that regard, right? So, like, what are you looking for in the situation? What would be the perfect situation for you? Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think because of, the, like, the type of music that I make is very, like, I don't want to say it's pop, but it's, like, pop-leaning, you know? Like, I think it's it's music that you could hear on, on, on a radio. It's, it's music that, like, you know, could get a you know sort of mechanical push like it could there could be a label behind it and it feels authentic and it feels like it works you know so like what i'm when i'm going into these conversations it is that it's like the i want to be on someone's tour i want to be you know i, I want to be on the radio i want to get you know connected to certain opportunities that only labels will have i think a lot of it is just like connections of even if it's things that are kind of uh, like random connections where they get reached out about, hey, there's this opportunity, we're looking for an artist at this festival, or we're looking for, you know, an artist at this, uh, you know, this movie, this da 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 da, whatever it is. It's like they do have those connections, and it's kind of hard to, specifically in the kind of pop leaning lane, to, to grow to, you know, a sizable size without that. Whereas, you know, in, in maybe in hip, if you're like straight hip hop, I think it's, it lends itself more to the, the like, I'm independent thing. And obviously, if you become a superstar, then you're going to want to sign a label. But like, I think, yeah, genres definitely matter in that. It, it's funny. We were just talking, I think, yesterday about how pop doesn't have an underground scene. Or it doesn't feel like pop has an It's either you're non-existent or you're at the top of it you yeah, know what I'm saying? Do, yeah. you, do you feel that way like being yeah. a popular artist oh definitely yeah yeah yeah. that's definitely a thing yeah i mean i think it's i mean i think 
part of it is that it's the type of music that if it hits, it hits. You know what I mean? Uh, like, it, I think for better or for worse, if you make music that feels like it's in kind of a pop lane, it's harder to make the music connect with a specific niche. It has to connect really broadly. You know, it's it's like, you know, because you're not like, bro, hey, come on, check out this new pop song that just dropped. You know, it's like, you, you know, <laughs> like it's it, it, so like kind of part of the whole theme of the music is that it's like very like accessible. And so you have to, you know, when you're making the music, you, you, you can't really be an underground pop artist yeah. or you're just, I mean, you can be that, but you're just, you're not able to, like, you, you're in a box. You're small. You're, you're like, you, you're try, you have to be trying to be a pop artist. And, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's it. You just have to be trying to be the huge thing. And there's not really an in-between because, it, like, the type of music that it is doesn't really connect that way. Yeah, I, I will say this, though. It feels like, I guess, the closest to pop underground is early TikTok stars, right? Yeah. And what I have noticed about it is that you guys finally get to be unpolished in the way that other genres get to be unpolished, yeah. right? Like rap is very known for that. Like they can go shoot something off a flip phone and <laughs> you know what I'm saying, have a hit. Yeah. Hit credit the next day, but like pop artists, it's almost expected for you to come out as if you're already a successful artist to really capture people's attention. Yeah. Like so do you do you feel like you're seeing the like the authenticity or even just some of that more unpolished stuff, like connecting with the with the pop audience? Or do you feel like it hits that side? The same way it might hit the your rap audience. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the authenticity part of it is huge, and I think like, like specifically on TikTok, especially like the the stuff where no matter what your genre is, like where it's you and the camera on a phone, and you're able to really connect with people about the thing that you're making, like that stuff performs really well, you know. So I think people. I think you're right that it makes it the the way that everything is set up now that you can have a direct relationship with your fans because of TikTok. It makes it to where it's easier to have something grow without being super polished. Uh, and, and I like that. I mean, for for me, it's like I think the way that particularly like we're talking about in pop music has been in the past is it only is like a label thing. It's like, the, you know, you have to, you have to be in a crazy music video on MTV yeah. and you have to be on, you know, every radio station. Yeah. Uh, but I think now, even though there is still that, like you're either big or you're small, on your way up, and even when you're big, you're able to like have more touch points with your fans because there's not the pressure to only talk to them in these huge, like polished things, you know? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But it, so then, all right, so before off camera, we were having a conversation where you were saying you're working on leveling up your content. You feel like it's time for you to kind of step into the more polished content, yeah. right? So if you're, you, you've seen results with the, the lower quality content, it's, it's obviously working for you. Where did that thought process come from? Like, what made you go like, hey, now it's time for me to level this up and, and maybe go for a more polished look? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a mix, right? Like, I, I, I don't think that the goal is to just have the polished stuff, but I think what, what I want to do is add in with the, you know, the iPhone stuff, polished stuff, just because, like, I think subconsciously, when you see someone, always, like, it's them in their phone, it's them just chilling, I think, you see them as an up and coming person. You see them as like, I'm trying to make this thing work. Uh, but if you start to grow and then you start to switch up your content to like, there's some more professional things, I think in people's brains, it starts to feel like, oh, okay, like this person's a real artist now, you know? Uh, and so that's what I want to do, which I think, yeah, I think it wouldn't be wise to just be, you know, now everything's shot on a red and I, I spent you know 20k on every tiktok video like that's not a, like i'd want to have the iphone stuff and the other stuff but i think you just got to figure out what the mix is over time and maybe there's a point where you're such a huge artist that it doesn't make sense to be posting iphone videos at all but i think i don't know i think right now it's just like it's time to at least start to look like there's some real like 
intentionality behind everything that I'm doing. Yeah, that makes sense because we we've had other videos where we've said, you know, if if I'm a a music fan and you know most music fans aren't super paying attention to rising artists, like they find a couple they like, they watch you, but they're not really paying attention to the underground space. It's typically artists and people in the music industry that are doing it. Yeah. So if I'm paying attention to Travis Scott, Cardi B, you know what I'm saying, these big artists and they all have a certain quality to it and then I come across, you know, you, you know, not you, but like an artist with yeah. that doesn't match it, then your brain does go to like, okay, maybe they're not as serious as yeah. these artists that I'm watching that are doing that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's real. And I think it's the same, I mean, it's the same way that if you see an artist on a festival lineup that you like, or you see them hanging out with other artists that you like, then you're like, oh wow, like they're they're pretty they're dope. They're, yeah, yeah, they made it, you know. And I, it's the even same if way. they really haven't, even if they really haven't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's that's what I'm trying to do, at least from a video standpoint. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You were talking about doing showcases, right? Now, in Atlanta, showcases have a bad rep. Right. And an artist that where you that's where you are uh, probably would like look down on a showcase, right? <laughs> like I'm I'm too popping. I already have a million plus monthly listeners, etc. How do you look at showcases? Why and why do you still do showcases? Yeah, I mean, I I like the well. I think L.A. We we were talking about this before we were shooting, like. It, it is true that the community here is like different from in other places like around music it's like there's there's a lot of artists there's a lot of sessions going on but i think it can be hard to like as a fan or as even as an artist like feel like okay here i can name the up and coming la scene like here's all the you know so i like showcases because it like allows me to be around other artists and to the fans it's like this is the LA these like this is the LA scene you know what I mean uh but I mean I, I I do I do see why people don't like showcases I think you have a lot more control when it's just your thing you know and so I'm not you know I'm not gonna tell you I'm trying to do showcases for the rest of my life you know it's just a thing where it's like I like it right now because it's a way to do a show without prepping at all. Like, I don't have to call the venue. I don't have to do anything. Somebody emails me and they're like, want to hit another one? And I'm like, bro, easy, I'll do it. And then I tell my people and then people show up, you know? But I do think that as I've grown, it's become a thing where it's like, when you're at a showcase and a lot of the people at the showcase are there for you and like the majority of the people at the showcase are, are there for you, it's like, man, would I be making more money if I was just doing this on my own and I wasn't, you know, giving away this cut to all these other people? You know, I think that's definitely a, a part of it that right. I'll think about now. But yeah, I, I like I like feeling like I'm a part of a community of artists that are rising up, and so mm. that's, that's yeah, that's great to hear because yeah. again, a lot of artists are not trying to be around other artists, which is an interesting take. But I always. Um, Love to hear artists who are like really collaborative and sounds like you like probably learn from other artists. What do you, do you look at it as practice as well in some sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of, a lot of the showcases that I've done, it's like the person hit me up before I had another thing that I was going to be performing at. And I'm like, oh, I get to, I'm going to run the same exact set list. And I'm, it's basically my rehearsal for this other thing that I'm, you know. So I think a lot of times it, it helps in that way, for sure. Like I just did one uh, last week and then I have a show coming up next week and it was like, all right, let's try out that show. And I was like, there's some new music that I, it's like a comedian where they're like trying out new jokes, you know? It's like, hey, I've never played this song before anybody. So let me play it here. And then when I, you know, do it in front of a different audience, I'll be ready. Got it, got it. Now, you also mentioned that you know, you have a cool situation where you got hired by a company, right? You had an upcoming company where one of their founders was interested in you as a fan and said, hey, come out and perform for my company. One, 
Like, that sounds pretty cool. Like, was that, was that kind of like, yo, this shit is kind of cool? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, it's your, and it, like, so you have a, your first, was this your first, like, private show like that? Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. And that was, like, they reached out to you, not nobody seeking to book it, anything like that. Yeah, yeah, just hit me up. Yeah. <laughs> so this is before that experience, so we can't ask how it was or how True. it's going to yeah. go yet. Would, would definitely love to hear uh, what, what that's like, but... You know, it's it's cool to like be in that position and know that that can happen still pretty early. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. you think about Beyonce performing for some royal family's wedding. Yeah. Right. You don't hear, yeah. hey, I'm not even signed yet. And I'm like taking off on TikTok and I'm performing at for some legitimate event that's yeah. that's private. That's kind of cool. Yeah. No, I like it. I, I like I think it's I think it's a cool way to like connect with fans and I think it also like it plays it it works well for me because like right now I have a song that I have not yet released that's doing well on TikTok and I like the song is finished but we still have some paperwork stuff that we're figuring out so there's a lot of people who haven't heard the song and a great way to tease those people is to be like I just played it for this private group you know what I mean so like stuff like that, it, it kind of works for me because it's like, oh, we're in a cool venue. There's not that many people. It's a secret thing. This wasn't told to everybody. And I played in a song that nobody's heard, but that a lot of people want to hear. And then I, you know, make a video of that and I post it and I'm like, hey, y'all better, you know, look. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Speaking of like the marketing bag, actually, you alluded to like still figuring some things out, right? You haven't done... I guess as many as your own solo shows yet, and I think you touched on like still trying to figure out some of the things in terms of your content. It all alludes to like what is my brand, right? Yeah. Have you thought of like what is the Paul Russell experience for your shows, right? How is that different from a showcase? Have you started to get there and uh, and think about that? It's a thing I've started to think about. Yeah, I, I, and I think. I think just in general, like branding is a thing I've been trying to figure out because I, I think figuring out who the audience is is the first step, right? Of like, you know, who's connecting with the music. And that's a thing that now that like I've grown a lot, even over the past month, like everything has grown by like 5x. Uh, and so a lot of right now is me being like, who are all these people, you know? And, and, and trying to figure out how that fits into things. And like, what do, they, what do they like about this music? So that as I'm trying to create experiences and create, you know, whatever, like it doesn't feel like it misses what they were interested in the first place, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me, it's like the type of music I make is very happy and it's very like, I don't know. It's the type of it's the type of stuff that you listen to when you're driving around with your friends. Like my my music spikes on Friday afternoons because it's like people are chilling with the homies, you know. Wow, and that's so, cool to hear. That's like, so specific, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a dope stat. <laughs> yeah. And so so yeah. So it's like like the I want everything that I do to feel like that. To feel like hanging out with your friends. So it, it's like we've been thinking about like okay, what are pop-ups that we can do what are shows that we can do and even you know like just how can we make everything feel like you're in a you're part of a community by liking the music and how can we turn that into you know not just here's me doing a show but what if it's a party that's vacation themed or something or like it's a cool pool party or it's like, like you know like i think there's all these different things that you can look at and like references you can take in that like connect more with the like hanging out with my homies but it's really a big show for an artist you know yeah. so i don't know that's that's how we've been thinking about it right now but it's still a thing that we're figuring out it sounds like when you think about community like you get into pictures like what are these environments? What's actually happening while they're listening? Everything yeah. you just said that like what am I, it's almost like a, a focus group, like a, a, a very traditional marketing focus group would be like, what do they drink? What do they watch? What are oh, they? Yeah. But you're do, you're saying that, but it's not in like a really marketing way. It's, it's a very organic like, hey, my music sparks spikes on these days. I would love them to feel like they're hanging out with my homies, but. 
those visions, like there's a lot of different versions of hanging out with my homies. Sure. Let's put it that yeah, way, right? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, can you get more specific on like what you think your world looks like? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, uh, I mean, I live in LA. It's very summery here. But I also, a lot of the music that I make is like music that you would hear on vacation or music that you would hear, at, like honestly, some of it now is like, wedding music even like like at a celebration or it's like i'm chilling by the pool like that kind of thing and so yeah i mean i think i think figuring out how that ties into specific places and how that ties into specific events is a thing that we're still trying to get more specific on but yeah i mean i think the world feel like the the paul russell world definitely feels like this kind of like it's my day off type of thing like where would you be on those days and how can we like a thing we've talked about a lot like there's a brand called vacation that it's like a sunscreen brand mm -hmm. and they're really cool because their whole thing is like like vintage uh like pool beach resort type of stuff and it's, you know, it, it, it all is like the, the photography on it, it you know, it, it, it's all like vintage type of stuff. And they like, they like really lean into it. And I, I think the way that I'll think about it is I'll look at a brand like that and go like, okay, like, how can I create a version of that around That's the music that I'm making? That's a dope hack. Yeah. Like, they, did, they did the work already. They did the work. All right. right? Yeah, Let yeah. me kind of see, cause it's kind of painting my world for me a little. And I love the... The language you're using, man, it's, it's, it's very much so not like, hey, uh, I'm going to I'll just be happy or I'm trying to reach, like I'm emo or something like that. To say my day, my day off, like that, I actually felt something when you said my day off, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, like painting those pictures, it seems like you're probably going to like, do very well at, at getting, um, you know, that community and painting that world that you're talking about. Because even the vintage. I already kind of felt that from you personally. Yeah. Maybe it's the bowling shirt, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but I already felt that that vibe, like that would make sense in your world. What are you inspired by to that degree? Like, for instance, you got a couple of albums over there. Yeah. Are, are Do you actually listen to those or are those like... I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I grab... Grab them. Let's, 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 let's get let's, it. Let's, let's talk about these right here. Oh, man. We got to start out with Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life, which is a hard-ass title, by the way. You're scared me, bro. You're sounding, yeah. you're sounding confused. This movie. Really? No, no. I was just trying to make sure I, I read it in an articulate way. Yeah. You, know? Yeah. you know what I mean? I'm warming up my reading right uh, now. You know, so yeah. I'll read the other ones faster. Yeah. <laughs> Saying cursive? I haven't read cursive in years. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. yeah so what does this project mean to you as an artist? Man, well, I love Stevie Wonder. I think he's obviously a great musician. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that he's someone who, uh, you know, I talked about the wedding thing. I don't see myself as somebody who's generally making wedding music. But, like, there's a lot of Stevie Wonder songs that you'll hear at something like that. You'll yeah. hear at a big celebration, right? And there's, not a, there's a lot of artists, well, I'm not there, there is not a lot of artists who are making music that feels like it fits in that place right now, at least in my opinion. I mean, I've had some conversations with even labels about that, about the fact that like there was a time, you know, obviously we can talk about the Stevie Wonder thing, but even, you know, more recently, like if we talk about people like Akon or people like, even I know it's corny, but like Pitbull. Mm -hmm. Like, though I, I love Pitbull though. I'm a big fan of Pitbull. But like those people were making like the party songs of an era. But it wasn't club music. It was just like happy, like feel outside feel good music, you know? It's not cool to be happy right now for it's some reason. It's not cool to be happy for some reason. <laughs> but I think the reason that some of the stuff, like more, my more recent stuff is connecting is because it is that happy music, you know? And it's like, I'm, think, I'm trying to think of it in a different way and I've been trying to create it in a way where it's like, how can you make something happy but not corny? And I think part of it is what you're talking about in this song. Part of it is the way that you say things in the song and, you, you know, but I think that's what I'm trying to do. And so talking about Stevie Wonder, it's like, I feel like he did that for sure in this album. Um, like making stuff that like you connect with and it feels real, but it also is just a happy song you're going to listen to, you know, 
when you're outside. It made me think of something. Before I go to the next project, so Marvin Gaye like, came out as an artist. You know, People loved him. But when the world changed, there was, in the war, there's all these things going on. You know, he wanted to talk about music of that time. Barry Gordy didn't want him to come out with that, like be political or anything like that. He comes out with what's going on and it connects, right? Yeah. Happy music, right? Do you think it's a good time for happy music? Mm-hmm. Like, and when you think about the, the, um, the climate, because you actually touched on a version of this earlier when you said that um, like people didn't want to hear music on TikTok, oh, yeah. right? It's like, oh, we're tired of music at the moment. We're burnt out on music and now we're good on music on TikTok. Well, maybe there's a time when we don't want to hear happy music, but then maybe this space could be, or maybe it's a year from now, maybe this is the time. How do you look at the climate in that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think part of it's a framing thing, for sure. Like, I remember, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> the, like... There is a song that I released that happened to come out, like, you know, I planned it weeks in advance. This was back in 2020. It came out the week that George Floyd died, but it was the happiest song I'd And I think, like, you know, I was like, crap, like, nobody is <laughs> trying to hear this right now. But the song ended up doing really well. But I think the reason that it did was because it, I framed it as kind of like, this is an escape from the world that we're in right now. You framed it in the like packaging of how you introduce it from a marketing perspective or in the song it was framed that way? In the, like from a marketing, like packaging oh. perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I definitely think it's like, if you're going to make happy music, you're right. You have to be cognizant of like what's happening around you at the time and like you have to communicate to your listeners in some way, sometimes it is in the song. Like, is this a song that is saying I'm happy with my situation? Or is this a song that is happy, but it's talking about something completely different? You know, maybe it's an escape or maybe it's like, I'm happy. I'm looking back on the good old days or maybe I'm happy for, you know, whatever. So I think, I think storytelling is important for that, for sure. Got you. Lionel Richie. Can't slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, Lionel Richie is sick, man. I actually, I went to, uh, I was in the, like, the live audience for American Idol, like, <laughs> this last season randomly. It was like, I had to connect. Thank you. Shout out. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I saw this man live uh, playing, like, I mean, yeah, he's a lot older now, obviously. But... Yeah, I, I like Lionel Richie a lot. I don't have that much to say about how it connects to the music that I make now, but I, I mean, I think it does. There's some, especially like the Commodores stuff. Like, yeah. How do you, um, you know, even if it's not drawn into your music specifically, just what do you appreciate about his artistry? Man, like, I, I, think, uh, I think that era of music was just fun. You know, and I think that, uh, yeah, Lionel Rich is just somebody who has a wide variety of different types of sounds, but that all feel like they're under one umbrella, you know, where it's like, yeah, it's the kind of like soul pop type of lane, but, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of different stuff in there that you can grab from. And I think he's somebody that did that in a cool way. So, yeah. I'm a fan. Dope. Louis Armstrong, a remembrance. Yes. Yes. I think, yeah, I mean, obviously, Louis Armstrong has a really interesting voice. Yeah. Uh, and I think, like, you know, I think what, I think I, uh, my voice is distinct, uh, like, to some degree, like, nowhere near his. But I, I think, like, he's someone who I feel like he really learned and understood his voice and like where it fit and how to use it, you know? And how to do that in a way that is extremely like, it's clear that it's him. Obviously, you know, if he talks, you know it's him. But like, it feels like he understood that, which is a thing that I'm starting, honestly, like over the past like year or so in music, like realizing how my voice is not just like the vehicle that I'm using to communicate the melody and the lyrics, mm-hmm. but it's like, 
something that's drawing people to the song in itself it's and like instrument. thinking yeah it's an instrument and thinking about like you know how can i use that instrument and i guess what i mean is like thinking about okay how much rasp do i need to be in me singing this part of this song or like how like i think something can I can be singing it more nasally or I can be singing it more from my diaphragm. And I think there's different reasons to do that in different types of parts of songs. Uh, and I think the way that that interacts with specifically the way my voice sounds, like I think learning more about that has helped me so much with music, you know? Cause I think there's a lot of times when I'd make a song and someone's like, this doesn't sound like you. And I'm like, bro, this sounds like me. What do you mean? I just sang it. But like figuring out what are the quintessential things that people connect with about my voice and then figuring out how to like optimize that for whatever I'm trying to create. That's dope. <laughs> <laughs> Just hearing that like this, it's so, what I love about it is it's specific to you as an artist, uh, yeah. right? Like we all know, beats and songs and just some of your interests and things like that, but then like your voice uh, it's specific. That's what you have, right? Yeah. And you saying something doesn't hit like somebody else saying something, yeah. right? Yeah. Like Jeezy, like how <laughs> like Jeezy tells the story of how Kanye used his his like one bar or whatever. And uh, what's up? Oh, can't tell me nothing. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, right. And but and it changed the nature of that song just that yeah. little bit, right? So it's cool to like it's like a to hear it's, it's like this self exploration uh, yeah. that has to occur beyond the art form of the music itself. Yeah, 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 it's real. I, like recently, my friend got, you know, the like, the thing where you can like, put different voices, uh, I guess you can like replace your voice with other artists' voices via AI. Like, oh, and yeah, so we, yeah. there's a song that I made that we were playing with like, okay, what would it sound like if Drake sang this? What would it sound like with it? And I realized how much, like, there's some artists where the AI can easily swap out my voice for theirs. But there's other artists where no matter what they do, it still just sounds like me. And it's like, even if you get the melody right, I mean, sorry, even if you get the, the, the like, pitch right, it just still sounds like me. But it's like, that's because there's certain ways that I say things that this artist would never say it like that. Like, they would, you know? And so I think understanding that also, it's like a thing where I realize, like, okay, there is something, like, really unique about how I sound, you know? So. And if yeah. you don't have that, maybe there's a problem. Yeah, true, true. I mean, and I, I think, yeah, if you don't have that, I think you have to figure it out in different ways. Like, there's a lot of artists who hate their voice, but they're able to, in the way that they mix it or in the way that they sing things in a really weird, unique way, like make it still connect and you're like you know this is dope but they don't even like their voice you know <laughs> yeah i think neo was somebody who said something like that before i think i heard him say his voice was nasally or something <laughs> yeah now i don't know these people so make sure i say it right the dave brubeck quartet yeah that's pretty good yeah yeah so tell me about the <laughs> yeah. the dave Look, brubeck it's, quartet it's real chill jazz music no lyrics, you know, it's, it's, it's a jazz band, they're incredible. It's like, it's very good just like chilling music, you know, um, and it feels classy, okay. which I like. That's what you put on when, you know, about to go on a little date with the lady, it's like, yeah, yeah come, come on in, I got you a little glass of wine, like, let's have a conversation, <laughs> like, it's good. You're, you're very vibe aware. <laughs> it's all about the vibes for me, for sure. <laughs> That's dope. That's dope, man. Yeah, these, it's a nice collection, man. I've, I'm aware of three of these. Got to like check into hey, this yes, one. Because I do like jazz music. I do like jazz music. Uh, okay. Well, with that being said, man, um, one of the final things I definitely want to kind of just get an idea from for you is you were in college when you like were like hey I'm pursuing being an artist still right yeah yeah you said you were studying labor relations yeah okay uh for for the audience who probably haven't heard what that is like can you explain what labor relations is before I get into my question yeah <laughs> for real. yeah it's a it's a weird major because like, I feel like if you asked any person who studied labor relations what the major is about, they'd all give you a different answer. <laughs> but it, it's like, 
I mean, obviously it's about labor. It's about like the work of businesses and like, like it was about work, right? And so I, I took a lot of classes that were about like labor economics or about uh, labor law, you know? Uh, but I mean, I think overall it was interesting to me because like basically every social movement that happened in like American history was been at least 80% related to labor, you know? Like even, you know, you think about the civil rights movement, it's like, we wanna be able to get the right types of job. Like we, we wanna get the, the jobs that other people are afforded the opportunities for, you know? Like that's a big part of it. And that's like, so, you know, you look at any movement, there, there's that labor aspect that's involved. Like how am I making some bread on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, learning the history of that was, was cool, but I don't use it at all anymore, but. <laughs> but. I mean, what even connected about it to even? Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what, what, what made you choose labor relations in the first place? Yeah, well, I, I, at the time I thought I wanted to be like a labor lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer for unions. Uh, but it also is a sort of, la sort of major where they tell you in the beginning, like, just do it and you'll figure out your path later on, you know? Because, I mean, to some degree, your, your major doesn't matter as much as I felt like it did when I was a high school kid trying to choose it, you know? Mm -hmm. But then when you get into it, you're like, oh yeah, whatever, I can do whatever and like figure out a path. Those kind of choices say something, right? Because even though we don't have any idea what this really looks like in the real world, when we go to college and we choose majors, like there's an idea at least in our head of what we think that is. So you said I want to be a labor, uh, a lawyer for unions. Yeah. Never heard anybody say that mess in <laughs> my life, right? What about that idea was attractive to you? Yeah, I guess part of it is two things. It was really like part of it was I really liked the idea of feeling like I was helping people, which I mean I think is very broad, and I think everyone to some degree wants to do that, but. I think to me it felt like law was an area where you can have a impact on people's lives by helping them in some way to you know fight against whoever. Uh, and the reason I was interested in the labor part of it was just because uh, you know I think for lots of different types of law there. You know, I mean, there, there's a wide variety and there's not necessarily a great way for a lot of them for you to feel like you understand the nuts and bolts of the industry that you're trying to be a lawyer in, like the, the, the industry that your, you know, practice of law is related to. And so for me, it was like, oh, I can study labor and learn about helping people with getting jobs or with like being represented as an employee somewhere. And then that can easily translate to a job where I'm a lawyer and I'm helping them specifically in that. And it felt like, it, it felt like an area where it was like there's an easy, there's a clear, at the time, this, it's, this is not really the case, but in my head it was like there's an easy good guy and a bad guy. Like the good guy is the guy who's on the side of the workers and the bad guy is the company. So it, I can easily, I'll study this and then I'm going to graduate, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to be a good guy. And then I'm doing it, you know. Uh, and I also liked English a lot, like as a subject, which people were like, oh, you like that? Like, you should be a lawyer. So. English, words, writing, <laughs> artists. Sure, yeah. You know, it all That's connects. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I mean, and even happy music, right? It seems to be there's always been this common thread with you where you care about people in some way or another. Yeah, and you want to yeah. be the good guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where's yeah, that come definitely. from? Man. I mean, I think, you know, a big part of it is like my faith, you know, like I, I feel like I'm on earth for a purpose, right? And so, and I think a big part of that purpose is helping people, you know, like, so, you know, I think when, when wanting to go the labor route, you know, a lot of it was just me being like, man, like, what... Like, all right, God, like, what is the way that I can help people, you know? And I think as I've done more music stuff, I've realized that that is a way to help people that I'd kind of neglected for a while. Like, I thought that you're really helping people if you're helping them with the, the legal stuff, but you're not helping people, you're just making them feel good. But then I got in the real world, 
And I was like, dang, like I, the amount of times that a song has completely changed, you know, my year or my my day just by making me happy at the right time, you know, like I realize that's important, you know. So yeah, I guess it comes from my faith, and I don't know where else. I just wanna, I don't know. I just wanna do good. <laughs> So what was that like when you say, hey, I've been pursuing this career. I'm playing around with music, but then when you knew, like, I want to pursue being an artist instead. Yeah, I mean, it was a weird process. Like, like I went to, so, you know, I was in college, right? And then I went to, um, I went to do an internship in, uh, like, in Southern California. And it was weird because, you know, like I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. And... I was just really struggling to get an internship that felt like it was connected to that. Uh, and I ended up taking an internship that was in, uh, in Orange County that had nothing to do with anything. Other than it was not law related. It was not related to anything at all for me that I thought was even cool. But I just applied to it because it, it was in LA. Or it was in Orange County, which was close to LA. And I just really felt like uh, like... Almost like, like, I felt like God was like, bro, I need you to be in LA. And it just, I just was like, okay. So I applied to this just because of that reason. I came out here and that's where I met people like Ruslan, who's like an artist that I made a lot of music with in the beginning. And I saw those guys like, and the impact that they were having and the way that the stuff that they were making was like, is a soundtrack to these, to people's lives, to like their fans' lives, you know? And like as I started making more music and like doing stuff with them while I was just out here on this internship, I just saw the you know the purpose in it, I guess. And I saw like what I wanted to create as well. Like I saw a path for myself of like I like what's going on here and I like what I'm doing. And I also see now what I wanna make and I see like this could maybe be a career, you know? And this could check those boxes that I wanted of helping people. And so so yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't like a one moment, all that happened, and then I'm like, all right, screw all the work, now I'm out here making music, you know, I think it was like realizing that, and then going on a journey of like figuring out what that looks like and how to live it out, but yeah. So when it's all said and done, what would you like to have at least accomplished in your career? Wow. <laughs> Big stuff. Um, Wow. Uh, okay. I think, you know, on a, I mean, a given is, you know, connecting with people, building community, having people like really feel, uh, you know, feel like the music that I've made has had an impact on them or feel like the music that I made has changed their mood uh, at moments that it mattered. Um, but I also want to make the song that can replace hotel room service. At the weddings, bro. You know, you know the song Hotel Room Service by Pitbull? Bro, that song, if you are the DJ at you're a DJ at any multi-generational event, play that joint and everybody's gonna have a good time. Hotel Room Service. Hotel Room Service is the song. song. I probably know the song and don't know. Hotel Room name. Service is the song. You know I never know names. All right, we're about to We play. at the hotel, hotel oh, holiday oh, inn. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> oh, man. Could have just came and sang that one. <laughs> yeah, holiday. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, you right. Get that. 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 Get and so it's like, bro, <laughs> it's like, I want to make a song like that, where it's like, if the party's dead, just put that on and everybody's going to have a good time. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's definitely something I want to accomplish for sure. Dope. Dope. I love that, man. Don't bring cookout music back. Cookout music, bro. That's it. That's what it is. It's cookout music. There's no more cookout music, bro. Yeah. It is. Everybody like, in the house. That's a special feeling that yeah, for real, for real. Like yeah. the, the multi generation, we can all have a good time. There's a there's a innocence to it, a, um, a purity to it where we're just having. Not that we don't enjoy other types of music, but it, it, it's it almost allows you to escape, as you said. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. I I love that. I love that. 
Well, thank you for allowing us to interview you, man, have a conversation. Coming your home with your furniture around. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and capture you with this matching back, <laughs> painting behind yeah, you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah, I just want to say everything I've seen from you and like everything that I, I've uh, even heard in this conversation, man, like the thoughtfulness is really, really cool to see. Um, throughout the journey and it's things are probably just happening sometimes it feels like they're moving fast but like in comparison to a lot of people that we work with that go through the process like you definitely seem like you have a a great like mind around it and you and you take it seriously so I'm looking forward to playing some happy music hey, let's you know get I mean? <laughs> in, my, in my future some yes, music sir. that I can play with my daughters and not have to cut it off you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> there's a place for that there's a there's a huge place for that um everybody thank you for tuning in this is yet another episode of no labels necessary podcast i'm brand man sean i'm corey and i'm paul <laughs> and we out Peace. appreciate you for watching if you like content like this you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com and the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on youtube we get straight to the information there's play by play in courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members. And it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.